Good evening, everybody. Once again, I'm Carla Christopher, York City's Fearless Poet Laureate and your host here at Culture in Maine. And I'm out of the studio and on the street again. This week, I'm at York Arts at 10 North Beaver, a true bastion for the cultural scene here in York, a great classroom and exhibit space. And the exhibit that's going on from right now up until August 3rd is artist Fred Haig. Now, he describes himself as a expressionary, interpretive realism painter. And I think that when you take a look at his work, you'll see where the realism and also the personal interpretation comes in. So join us for an absolutely cool gallery tour where the artist is actually going to walk us through his own work, telling us some of the behind the scenes stories. And then my friend Lee Thomas is going to come in and take over the episode back in the studio. And she's got a hilariously fun author, Lolita Kelson. Not to mention another super cool sculptor and artist, James Christian. And there's a surprise on the street visit with Lee to the Sunrise Soap Company. So stay tuned, sit back, and enjoy the gallery tour. That was when I had about a year after I moved into a new place and uh, on Beaver Street in York here. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to understand the space of the, okay. the, of the studio. For me, a, a lot of painting is about um, trying to push and pull space. And uh, almost like, you know, the way you would organize furniture in a room, only, only you're trying to use shape and, and color to, to push and pull the space. There, there's a lot of physical activity when, when, I, when I do painting. And almost all my paintings start like that, regardless of whether they end up looking more realistic or, or, or more abstract. Uh, they, they start with big pieces of color, big shapes of color, broad brush strokes, and as I develop the pieces, I start to, um, if they get more detailed, the brush strokes just get smaller. And I try to maintain the same mark and the same kind of quickness, and if I, if I find myself taking too much time... Something's wrong, something's wrong. Yeah, well, if I, get dwell, if I start to dwell in one little area, I, I, I typically will stop and start something else. And, Try to come back so you that. move pretty quickly. You start off with these broad strokes right. covering the canvas, right. then you start putting in and blocking mm -hmm. out the other pieces. Yeah. But you just you keep it moving. You keep that energy in motion. I try to. Yes. This isn't the oldest painting in the show, but it's it's the, I guess the second oldest piece in the show. One of the things I like about this are that you know for every you know three by three inch area there there's a, there's a lot of color, but everything is, is pretty much responding to what I see and what I observe. It's inexact, and uh, and it's not meant to be a, a photographic representation. representation. Yes, it's interpreted. But yeah. of a realistic right. scene, and you actually right. have these scenes yes. in front of you, right. and you paint, so that's where the lighting comes mm -hmm. from, and the, right. the different colors come so from. So they're very, there's like subjective yeah. realities, if you want to. I like that. I that's, say that you your know? style is subjective reality. Yeah, I think they look expressive sometimes, but uh, I'm not really thinking about expressing emotion. What I'm, I'm trying to paint the way it looks or the way I see it. So I guess I was more calm or more, you know, when, when I was working on this painting and, and maybe I, or maybe I wanted to capture this a little more accurately. There is something very soothing yeah. in this painting and the brush strokes are a little more subdued right. and, and smoother. Right. This is a smoother painting. Mm -hmm. Right, but it's still got, it's still, Thick, I, or, or, you, know, right. you can still see the paint. You I, still have the rough right, edges, right. and you still have. I mean, even in this white, right? Like there's everything but white. Right, right. All, well, all there's hardly ever gone. really. I mean, it's almost impossible to see real white unless you shine a light bulb in your face. This is '91. This painting over here is '90, and and oftentimes, if if the work is is more uh, broad stroke and kind of abstract. Uh, or, or less representation, then the next painting will be more figurative. It's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, if you write something and you just write a draft and you just spit it out and you don't really <laughs> think about, yeah, and you, you know, you're not really thinking about the way the words sound and the way, or maybe you are, but you're not. It's more like a stream of consciousness. Right, right, you're right, just right, getting that just getting feeling, out, right. that emotion out, right. as opposed to, I'm going to refine and exactly. craft this. It's really this 
interesting because in this painting, the chair really is, you know, almost rough. Right. And then we have over here another representation of exactly the same chair. Right. And then this one is so smooth and so specific. You know, the shape and the, the colors you use to paint it are completely different than the colors you use to paint it in another painting. So is that because the light was totally different in this scenario, or because your mood was different? You're just your approach. Well, to my this mood was definitely different? different when I did uh, both of these two paintings here, uh, and uh, I was going through a, a lot of things. And uh, I these are more recent now. These are the, yes, the earlier yes. painting was in the nineties. Right. These are both right. two thousand and eight. Right. And I, I, I thought I would sort of re-examine some earlier subject because. If you look at the painting there, that window seat painting, that has the same chair. Okay, uh, the chair. This chair is a, an old friend. I think the chair is a stand-in for, for people because the chair takes up the same kind of space and, you know, back to space again. Oh, and, and chairs, you know, you have overstuffed chairs, you have frilly chairs, you have very plain chairs, you have very, very functional chairs and right. very elaborate things and, and 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 you know they kind of have a personality plus you can see through them and 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 so that you can oh, actually, they have shape there's shape Touching and space you. in there and uh and they make neat shadows on the floor that you can play around with and then <laughs> then that round chair is, a, is an old uh, like ice cream parlor chair that came out of uh, my grandparents attic three paintings that have the chairs and the sneakers in and, I love and, it. and the sneakers have a kind of a symbolism. You know, Noel Sloboda, a great local poet. Great local poet is a personal friend, and uh, he said uh, that I paint goulash. So, so there are things there uh, in, in each one that has its its level. It's a kind of a certain level of symbolism. The, the greater the familiarity or the knowledge or the intimacy with the work, the more they're going to know. And and. And uh, for the casual observer, they can just go around and say, oh, hey, this guy paints the same chairs. Or, like maybe they see a bowl, like there's a bowl there, there's a bowl there, there's a cup there. You walk in the room and you, you, you're standing at the door and you see one painting and you see another one and there's similar things between the paintings. And she did, I think she did an awesome job of just putting, making things flow from one space to the next. She put the oldest painting and the newest painting on that wall. And you look there and you see her sitting on that couch. Well, she was actually sitting on the end of the couch that's cut off with that chair. Now, I'm intrigued by these word paintings yeah. because these kind of pop out as something very different from yeah. the rest of your style. Mm -hmm. Where did these come from? Well, I've, I've been doing these on and off since about 1986. And sometimes I did more and less, and sometimes I showed them and I didn't show them. And uh, I, there are two painters that I, I very much admire. One's Larry Rivers, and the other is 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 Richard Diebenkorn. Larry Rivers is a, is a kind of a pop abstract expressionist artist in the, in the, in the middle, and and uh, he he has realism aspects of realism, but expressive brushstroke and color. And he is also at that time of pop art, so he has stenciling in. And I like Jasper Johns, and they have stenciling in. And I like the immediacy of that. And, and uh, But I also like to write, like in the painting over there. So I might hear something, and uh, or see something, and it just stay in my mind. And what had happened, this was back in the days, this was uh, from 2007, so this is this was uh, back in the days when MySpace was more popular than, yeah. than Facebook. Right. And you know how people's MySpace pages could get hacked a lot. Or, oh, or yeah, people they could, definitely and, could. And, and, and so my friend had a GIF file on her MySpace page of these two girls kissing. And she was, in, she was sitting in this painting and she was complaining that, you know, when you every time you go to her MySpace page, it, it just runs this GIF file. So I just like jotted that down on there and then I just wrote girls kissing girls and, and I thought it was funny. And I, or at this time, we were sitting around um, a couple friends, and, and they were talking about, uh, oh, well, when's the end of the world going to come? And oh, my grandfather says the rapture is going to happen. And and and, and the I said, rapture well, will take right, care of right. it. And, and so they said, well, call your wife because she's a pastor, and she can she'll tell us. And, <laughs> and I said, I'll call her, but I know what she'll say. And and uh, so I called her while we were sitting there, you know, 
having an adult beverage and uh, <laughs> and I, I called her and said, well, what do you think? And she said, well, don't worry about it. The rapture will take care of itself. So I thought that was funny. And 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 um, one boy asked, he said, well, are these all the same girl? They all look the same. I, I don't think they look the same. I can't. You do have a, a melancholy I think so. female. Yeah. When I see the faces of the women in the exhibit, they all have yeah. a very introspective yes. sort of loss in a dreamy moment, but it's it's a slightly melancholy yeah. moment. You know, it's not about looking pretty, it's about no, capturing it's about them or being. in a moment, yeah. a moment that's very intimate. Right. If you weren't painting it, this is a moment that probably no one else would ever well, that... observe these women in. <laughs> There's a painting that's not here. It was up in the Harrisburg at a show. And it won a prize for figure painting. But the judge said, uh, well, when I was introduced to her, she said, oh, I thought this painting was, this painting, the artist for this painting was a woman. And I was like, why? Why did you think that? Well, I don't know, the way you painted the woman didn't see. I thought, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's good because I, men are not men are not always credited with being able to capture the subtleties of emotion. And yeah. you know the sensitivity, the the sort of vulnerability that comes across in the women that you paint. Oh well, maybe they're just grumpy because they had to sit there for three hours. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe just eat out one tomato, and we're just all you know we're looking for the no, soul of the like, Oh, I'm seeing this this she's thoughtful saying, vulnerability. Damn, I want to go home and get a snack. And she's like, I'm so hungry. <laughs> So this show is representing a true retrospective, yeah, it, it, a, a real cross section of your yes. work. We've got thirty years, yes. almost. Oh, Boda, yeah, he he really wanted that picture, and I. I it I, is a fantastic picture. We, That's one of my favorites in the show. I just really. Love her. Why do you? Why do you? Like that? There is a detail in her, you know, and in looking at her face and and just the color in her cheeks, the arch of her nose, the little curls of her hair. I really feel like I'm looking at almost a photograph because the oh. expression in her eyes, the, the thought in her mouth, the way that her hands are moving, but it's still done in this beautiful abstract huh. way. And she is so gorgeous, but totally unselfconscious. It's like looking at a very beautiful woman that she's about to go down the stairs into, you know, a party or a cocktail yes. party and put on her social face. Yes. And so we're catching her in that moment while she's stealing herself to put that social face on. And, you know, this non-smiling moment that, that she's not going to allow anybody else to capture. And I just, I mean, I could write 10 different stories. The poet well, you can write, you can write those stories. That would be really cool because she, she's like that. And I had this painting in a show then, and, and a friend of mine said, Oh, um, you know, these, these figures look like stuffed dolls. And, uh, and I, I didn't paint many figures after that because I didn't want to look, look like I was painting stuffed dolls. And that, Kind of upset me, and and and, and so I, I think one of the things I tried to do later was make sure that they didn't look like stuffed dolls. There was actually a, a poem that I just did that is called "Say the Words," uh -huh. and it mixes a ton of it mixes some curse words, uh -huh. um, you know, or vulgar words that right. you never want to say, but it mixes them in with words like rape uh -huh. or molestation, you know, okay. things that nobody wants to talk about, right. but it's considered inappropriate or impolite to bring up in proper conversation. And for me, the, it came from a, a frustrated, like, this is what encourages people to feel ashamed when things have happened to them. Yeah. This is what makes people feel like they can't talk about their emotions, and then they bottle them up inside, mm -hmm. and they become toxic, unhealthy people. When I write, I write to free myself, not just to free the words that I'm using. Like, the words are my vehicle, mm -hmm. but the feeling is freedom. And I want that for all people, yes. and I say, sometimes I write, angrily or I write um, provocatively just because I want to be like, I'm going to put this in your face. Right. I'm going to lay this out here because this is what's real. This is what's inside all of us. Yes. And it is healthier to let it out than it is to keep it bottled up inside and just pretend it doesn't exist. Right. I don't become a, I didn't become an artist to be a hypocrite. Right. To promote hypocrisy. That's what and that's what these are about. See? Which are shocking pieces. I paint what I see, and art community. Oh my God! Paint a gun. He painted a machine gun. And, 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 
and so I, th- I said, well, you know, this is the United States, and we have a long history of firearms in the United States, we and it's a big part of our culture, and, and also invention. I mean, you know, a Singer sewing machine and firearms manufacturing, those two things were, like, I mean, <laughs> That's true. You know, I mean those are, the, all that stuff is, is like incredibly precise, intense machine that, that happened at the turn of the, at the beginning of the 19th century. It was like science. I mean, you, you had your best people doing those kinds of things. And, uh, and, and I like to shoot. I think, you know, painting is very subjective, like we talked about, and it's interpretive. And shooting, it's either it's right on the money or it's not. It's a hit or it's a miss. And so, you know, when all your work is subjective, oh, is this color right? Is that color right? Oh, oh should I make, you know, whereas... You have a thirst for something where you can know, you okay, can I've done that. Right. That's bullseye. Right. right, but there is a bit of a dichotomy you know, and, and or duality. And I was telling the kids earlier, what, you know, I mean, the bunny was something a from my A bit of a youth. duality. Yeah, yeah. A machine gun well, and a stuffed bunny. But, but it's not a machine gun, it's just a rifle. Okay, a, a machine rifle gun is different. and a bunny. See, but, but there's myth attached to all this stuff, and, and, and you know, like a level of knowledge, like a, a, a person who's an aficionado would come in and say, wow, that's a, that's a foul. And, and other people say, oh, that, this is just a horrible black rifle. I think when you, sometimes you can read a very dry subject and but but you're t- you're taken away and you just wow this is you can just tell the person's right, the heart person's and soul is passionate in, 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 about and, it and I think it's the same with art I sometimes I go to a show and and the artwork is very carefully done very not, and but, I, but you know maybe that's just me too other times I see the same subject the same technique but it looks so much better and I don't know there's a spark I don't there's no way you can yeah. quantify that but but it's there and and, I think, and people recognize it. Yeah. I think that people recognize it. Well, I hope you enjoyed our tour at York Arts. ton of thanks to Mindy Christian and Kevin Lanker, plus the curator, Maggie Moran, who let us come in here and talk with Fred and meet with him and see this incredible art. Now, if you want more Fred, you can tune in on Thursday, August 29th at 7 p.m. on Channel 16 to An Ordinary Journey with Lee Thomas, and you'll actually see Fred appearing live on Lee's show, so you can call in and ask him questions or talk to him. So make sure to come down to York Arts and check out the exhibit, and then check him out on Lee Thomas's show at 7 p.m. Channel 16 on August 29th and talk to him live. In fact, Lee's here in the studio now. So let's bump over to Lee and see what else she's got cooking. Thank you, Carla. I'm going to have so much fun tonight because I get to host Culture in Maine all by myself. And I know Carla is one of the greatest hosts on TV. That's why I watch her show. But it's my turn tonight, so don't touch that dial. I'm not Carla. I'm Lee Thomas, and I'm here to have a good time tonight. I'm going to bring you some interesting guests, and we're going to take a little trip down to that corner of culture in Maine. I know, it's gonna be so much fun. Anyway, I wanna introduce you to my first guest tonight. I have known this man for years now, and he is probably one of the most Renaissance people I know. He's a makeup artist, incredible makeup artist. He's a medical esthetician, and he's an artist artist who absolutely adores his dog, Buster. And every week, Buster is in my studio when I shoot my show. So let me introduce you to Buster, and James Christian. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Buster, he's kind of sleeping he's, now. He's, he's tired. He's a little, he's, a, his, he's had his morning. Medicine and yes, he's, he's, uh-huh. it just, he's all zonked out. Good, so we'll so let him stay there. Because I don't know how he deals with you with all of the chaos you have in your life because you're going from doing somebody's makeup for a wedding, doing, make, doing my makeup but without you every Thursday night, I'd be in big trouble. Uh, so without doing makeup, you're running off to work on a piece of art, or you're running off to tattoo somebody's eyes, which, by the way, I could use a little help, okay? Yeah, well, it doesn't look too bad, though. <laughs> uh, so how do you keep it all together? I write everything down. I make a list every day, because otherwise I don't remember what in hell I'm doing right. most of the time. I know that for a fact. It's, you know, it's, it's not fun getting this older. old. <laughs> older. Over 20. <laughs> Over 20 a couple times. Yeah, that's right. Over 20. So how did you start with your art? Well, I want to back up and tell you a little bit of what my belief is. My belief is that 
as you remember, the first time I met you, I said, I saw you at the end of this long white corridor and there was a temple and you were in there doing your thing and it was another lifetime. Right. And then you told me something about someone else told you something similar before. Mm -hmm. I, my fascination with faces is partially because of past life. I remember a number parts, fractions of, of several different lifetimes, mostly Egyptian, but also some Mayan Indian stuff. Okay. I was a priest there, but I was a priest artisan for the, for the uh, pharaohs of Egypt at least once. And so I've been doing work on faces for a long time. And I have just named you, I have dubbed you <laughs> the face collector. Because you yeah, do, you, you, do. Co I, you co and I didn't even realize that I do collect faces. You do, and it is a little weird too. But anyway, <laughs> I know. So you have a process that you go through, yes, uh, and, and doing your masks. And so you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, the process I do is really kind of reverse of the way you cast somebody's face. I don't make a negative, and then pour something into it to make the positive. I make the negative and the positive together, but then I only work on the positive side. And I started doing that because I was wear making wearable masks for celebrities and uh, society people in Miami in the 70s. And one of my favorite masks that you made is King Tut. King Tut is the most incredible piece of art I've seen in a long, long time because it's just so incredibly beautiful and all the hours of work that yeah, you've well. put into King Tut. Uh, and I think we have a picture of King Tut uh, that we can show everybody. Just the two masks that Tut holes are so beautifully done. So that's the finished product. And we have um, a sample here of what you start with. Once yes, you've this cast is that. Well, this is you've actually cast a the casting. Face. That's actually a finished piece. And my whole thought on this is when I started really wanting to make formed faces of clients, I kept going back to the original death mask techniques that they used to do. So this would be a death mask technique? Well, the person was alive, so I call it a life mask. If okay. he was dead, he would have been a death mask. But just like with President Lincoln and some of the other presidents before, they would make molds of their faces before they passed away, and they would make them, like Lincoln was had death masks done several before he was killed, and then they did one after he was dead. So, but it's a very interesting thing about that is, in particular with President Lincoln, they could see that they thought he had a neurological disease of the face. And you mentioned stroke, but there was a neurological disease of the face he had on one side. And I remember seeing this whole program on it that was causing one side of his face to drop. Right. And it wasn't a stroke. That He may have had a stroke, but that wasn't it. Mm -hmm. But it's just like when they take a mummy apart and they can dissect it, and even with the MRIs and stuff they can do now, they can and extract some DNA, they can tell lots of stuff about that person that was dead. Exactly. Well, I choose to make life masks because I wanted to use my art to bring life to and help to those that I thought were worthy of it. But, but again, I didn't realize I was collecting faces, but I've been doing this for years because I have several hundred faces in, packed away that are fine. This holds up very well as long as it doesn't get wet and I have preserved it inside so it doesn't fall totally apart. And on the outside, it's painted with um, some makeup and some uh, special type of chalk powder. Okay, okay. But I wanted this just to be very simple and the gentleman that sat for this, I did this in the early 80s and he was a professor that went around the world and tested people that were getting their, hopefully getting their professorships. He was a tester, whatever that really meant, I don't really know, but. So besides having the mask, you have the whole story behind the mask, which would be yeah, a great all the, book. Also, you all these put people, it everyone, everybody, the faces I've cast, I remember when, I don't, I, I really tune into the person, I can tune into their mood, but also as, I'm also a, um, I don't like the word psychic healer, I'm a touch healer. As, as you know, I, mm -hmm. I do all this weird stuff. Right. But with the, um, healing, I believe that by casting someone's face, I'm always linked to that person. Right. And you know, we both, you've studied Reiki, so mm -hmm. you kind of understand that connection. So I believe that I can project to a face through my mind with Reiki or some, however I work to help that person uh, to be healthier mentally, physically, or emotionally. 
if I choose to. And one of the things you've done for Angel's Voices, mm -hmm. because uh, Angel's Voices is, you know, my, yes. my organization, yep. uh, we help people who've been bullied or abused, any kind of abuse. Uh, and one of the things, one of the pieces of art we created was uh, because of the book I wrote, people would look at me and they'd say, but you don't look like somebody who would have been abused. Exactly. And so what does somebody look like? So you helped me with this incredible project. It took us a long time, but we cast about 50, pa 50 yep. faces. Uh, we chose children, adults, teens, every ethnic or group out there, uh, people who had been abused and people who hadn't been abused. been abused. And we put their faces on this big piece of red canvas and we had it in, uh, it was in an art gallery and people, the public got to come in and take a look at all of the faces and they got to decide who'd been abused. Of course you can't, you no, know, you can't, you can't but, but that gave so much healing to a lot of people who had been abused, their face was there. You know, they got to see that, and I thank you for that. Uh, that that was a, it's a huge piece of art, and it's yeah, an important piece. Yeah, I mounted piece. it on red, by the way, because of the energy of violence. And right. That's, and that's why I wanted to go the total opposite with the white of the castings. And so another, everybody looked the same, didn't matter what color you Well, that's you were. it, exactly. Because we're all generic looking when we, when we remove the hair. Exactly. And makeup. Exactly. And mustaches and beards. And, and we've... You've helped other organizations, uh, especially with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And you have um, a work of art over here on the wall right now that to me is very, uh, a very healing thing. Uh, and so you, you cast the upper torso. Yes. Okay. Of a client that volunteered. May I look this way now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the casting represents, uh, the, um, the person that sat for this casting was somebody that I knew that I didn't feel embarrassed to ask her and I thought I'd be okay casting this because I cast right over her, br her brassiere and actually to take it off she had to come out of the brassiere because it was stuck to the inside of the casting. Right. But the whole idea was I wanted to do something, actually one of my other clients su suggested because when I started talking about doing this they said I would volunteer if you wanted to do a whole segment of going from somebody that was going to have their breasts removed or a, a, a breast removed to the complete rebuild, which gave me an idea. I ended up doing this because I wanted to have, give the women that have been going through have breast- Have survived it. Have, been, yeah. have survived, mm -hmm. to have a place to put their names. And right. it was a way of me honoring them. I, I love and this because it's got my mama's name on there, you know, yeah. so, um, and she was uh, almost 10 years breast cancer survivor when she passed away. And I don't know if you remember, the frame was a piece of discard. By the way, when this new studio was being built, that, that frame was actually part of a packing that was held one of these monitors. And I thought that'd be really cool. The only thing is it's kind of soft, so it's a little hard to deal with. It's like a hard, hard marshmallow. But, but uh, it's coming, it's going to be up in um, Hanover and Gettysburg in the near future for some s signatures. I'm hoping to get the frame and this covered with signatures. Signatures from the survivors. And they're gonna have the date of the their diagnosis, mm -hmm. and if someone has a friend that passed away from cancer that didn't survive, they I, I, I will allow someone to put their name and the date okay. on. Okay, and so I thank you for that. I thank you for that. Now, one of the masks that you did that I absolutely love, and and it actually became a birthday present for me, uh, is one I don't think you really like. But the first no, time, no, I did like it. The first time I saw this when you did the uh, gallery mm -hmm. uh, showing, and I walked in, and I think it's part of my past life. Too, Could you know, be. because I instantly was drawn back to where I expected to see this person running. So I think we have a picture of um, it, it's like a, a, a mask. It's an upper torso. It's a face and a neck and the upper torso of a, of a man. Right, and to me, it's just one of the most incredible things you've done. And the work on that was taken from. Uh, a tribe that may longer, no longer, uh, um, the paint job on this is actual makeup from an uh, African native, from a, a, I think the people were called the KU people from someplace in Africa, but I have a book on it. Um, and they may not even exist anymore because of the, the encroachment of human, other humans okay. destroying where they live. But that's an actual makeup that I copied. I want to, um let everybody know because we're almost out of time here to let everybody know a new program we're doing together uh it's one of my favorites and so we could actually use this we're doing a new program together and it's called Lift up higher. face it so what we're doing is 
since Angel's Voices does everything with bullying and abuse, we are now asking people who have been abused or are going through cancer or they've got something going on in their life that uh, is an obstacle for them and we're going to cast their faces and then they can paint it any way they want to. Yes. And that way when they're going through the rough time of their life, they can take that face and look at it so that they get their strength back. So it's a symbol of mm -hmm. who they are and how brave they are. So it's a pr new program called Face It. Face and I it. thank you for coming in and helping me with that program. I think it's going to be a very important program in the community. I hope. Yeah. I hope. Now, one of the things, as, as I said, we've only got a couple of seconds here. One of the best makeup jobs I think you ever did. Okay. And it's a picture of you. And I love me. this picture. Yes. So take, if you can show me that picture of James, that would be great. So there you go. I love that picture. It's the best makeup job. Who is that person? <laughs> <laughs> That's you when we had a, a photo shoot. But I love how you create characters when you do your makeup. No, it's fun. Makeup. I'm painting. Yes, you're, that's painting. it. You're painting. I was just going to say that. Um, I did want to say one thing real quick. Okay. The, I'm going to be doing a piece with the plastic surgeon from out of this area that's going to be that thing I wanted to do. That where you one start of my at clients, the beginning and go all yeah, the way through? Where a, uh, and it may be multiple women, we don't know yet, that'll have a, a total breast removal and then go the whole way through, follow them the whole way through the total rebuild. But it might be multiple people rather than just one person. Okay. But that's in the works. That'll be an incredible art exhibit. Well, and it's also going to be, a, it's, well, It'll be healing again for women yeah, who've gone exactly. through it. Exactly. Right. It won't be so realistic because it's going to be done in this form, so it's not going to look like human pieces. Right, right. So thank you again for everything that you do. Um, thank you for being a guest on my show. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm here every week. I know. <laughs> Almost. But, but thank you for being a guest on Culture in Maine. And thank you. We'll, thank you to we'll check in. Too. We'll check in on you later. Okay? okay. Thank you. So welcome back to Culture in Maine. I have someone I can't wait to introduce you to because I've known her for a while. She came to me and she said, I'm going to write this book. And I said, okay. And she said, what do you think of this for a title? So let me first introduce you to Lolita A. Kelson, and I'm going to let her tell you what the title is. Hi, hey, girl, Lee. how are you? I'm well. It's so good to see you. I again. know, bright and bubbly as usual. Yes. So um, thank you for showing up today. Thank because you for inviting me. Because I've been wanting to talk about this book for a long time. And I've been wanting to talk about it. So, what's the title of the book? The name of the book is It's Not Personal, It's P. You know what it is Real Men Feel. Now, what's the other title? It's not personal, it's penis. Okay, that's it. Real, Real men, men feel. feel. Right. So, question, question, question. Why did you decide to write this book? I decided to write this book, and that's an excellent question, and a lot of people ask me that question. I decided to write this book because I saw a need for men to... Um, uh, talk? You meant to share, talk, yes. You meant to talk, for men to share, for men to real open feelings. up, right? To open up and right. share their feelings, right? So, and I guess a little background: you do have a degree in psychology. I sure You do. just didn't decide. Well, I'm going to write this book because I know better than anybody else. No, no. Okay. Actually, and I've known so many men through the years who were able to open up and talk to me honestly. And whereas they were able to talk to me, they were unable to talk to their significant other. Why? They felt that sometimes they weren't listening, and they weren't, not that necessarily the women weren't listening, but the men sometimes felt they weren't heard. Okay. There's always been this thing between men and women, though, when yes, it comes right. to communication. Mm -hmm. uh, most people who, who watch me on television know that from my book, I was married to the F word. Mm -hmm. And, um, <laughs> and um, nice way to put it. Yes. And so um, we went to couples therapy. And one of the things I learned that was so important was how to have a discussion. Mm -hmm. and, and I know it goes back, it's cliche, and people will say, well, that's what every shrink says. But there's something to be said about it. Sure. And so it's, I hear you say, and then you shut up and let them talk to you. Exactly. You know, I think part of the problem is people are always over-talking each other. Exactly. And that leads us to a chapter in the book. He means what he says, what do you hear? It's important for people to listen and to understand and to articulate exactly what you mean. A lot of men, for example, if you ask a lot of men, most men, a yes or no question, they answer you yes or no, void of an explanation. 
just like if you called me up and asked me, what was I doing Saturday night? Do you want to go to a party? I would say, Lee, I won't be able to make that party because blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. If I ask a man that question, hey, what are you doing Saturday night? Would you like to join me to go to this party? Nah. And that's what he means. Exactly. And he means, no, he doesn't want to go to the party. It doesn't mean, no, he doesn't want to hang out with me, or he's not in the mood to be at a party. It just means, simply means no. Right. Now, here's something that, and it's another form of communication and a solution, I hope. Mm -hmm. When I was with the F word, and we won't use him anymore today, I hope, <laughs> but when I was with the F word, I could be in, in any room in the house. And I would hear this scream come from, Hun, Hun, mm -hmm. where's the ketchup? In the refrigerator. Hun, I can't find it. Where's the ketchup? He wasn't looking. It was in the top, it's in the top shelf. Probably eye level. level. He's looking right at it, but he can't see it. Right. You know, and so I learned from that as well that if you have a mate like that, you treat them as if they were blind and you put everything back in the same spot. That way you never have to have that little fight with him. <laughs> exactly, key point, you accept him for who he is. Right. Which brings us to another chapter okay. in the book. I forgot the chapter. Well, we got some chapters here, let's take a look. Um, which one? Um, Oh, you get change for a dollar, not from a man. He is who he is. And don't you just hate it when you have a girlfriend who's in a relationship that's not going to go anywhere because she's not listening? Yes. Because she wants yeah. to change him. I'm going to, when we get married, I'm going to change him. Exactly. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. People are who they are. Mm -hmm. Men are who they are. And honestly, they don't want you to try to change them. Exactly. They love being the men they are. There is a show on television right now that is just driving me crazy. And it's one of the reality shows. And it's the first year of marriage. It's the newlyweds. Uh -huh. And there's one couple. This guy is so egotistical. He doesn't care what she wants. It doesn't matter. And she talks to him till she's blue in the face. And you just see this look on his face. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not going to happen. You know, no. she went out and bought a couch that he didn't like, so he put it in the bedroom so he doesn't have to look exactly. at it. And he's not there. He lives in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> and she can't force him to like exactly. it. Exactly. You know, and she can't understand why he doesn't like it because he told her he didn't like it before they bought it. Exactly. Yeah. It's and not he meant that. It's exactly. He meant that. Again, it's people listening to whoever it is they're having this inner, you know, uh, conversation with. Because when you get on more than one level, You've got to listen. Exactly. And you have to hear what's being said. Mm -hmm. And your interpretation may be different. That's why it's important to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I like that little, I hear you say, and then you say what you hear them say. Right. Because you regurgitate what you exactly. think you heard. Exactly. And sometimes it's not what you think it is. I know. That's I know. why they have to rephrase it. And still, at the end of the day, when they rephrase it, they're still saying the same thing they said to begin with. So exactly. if you're not listening, it's, you, you exactly. know. Exactly. So let's look at some of these other chapters. Um, um, be yourself, don't pretend. Be hey. yourself, don't pretend. Hey, 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 hey. A hey. good example, Lee, is if you don't like football and you don't understand why it takes three hours mm -hmm. to play a game that mm -hmm. really can be done in one why sit through the football game with your uh, husband, with your boyfriend, with right. your significant other, or while you're dating? Mm -hmm. Be yourself. Don't get those pom-poms out. Exactly. <laughs> Be yourself while you're dating. You're not the cheerleader for the team. Exactly. Yeah. Because when he takes you home and unwraps the gift, and on a Sunday, and now you live together and you're married, mm -hmm. and it's Sunday and it's 1 o'clock, and mm -hmm. he wants to watch the, the Super Bowl mm -hmm. Ravens play. Right. Well, there you and go. And he says, come on, honey, have a seat. We're mm -hmm. going to watch the game. And you say... No, I think we're going to go to Lowe's right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He totally doesn't get it. Oh, right. I never did like football. So why did you pretend? Exactly. Don't pretend. Right. It take doesn't those, work take out. Take those pom-poms and put them back in where they belong. Exactly. So um, his man, oh, I love this one. Uh, his man gave. Do. Peace, be Peace, still. Peace, be still. Mm -hmm. Men have described the man cave as their spot. Right. Where they go and where they retreat. And if they want to go to their man cave and do absolutely nothing, Lee, they're doing absolutely nothing on purpose. That's what they want to be doing at the time. My question is, 
why do you not understand it's a man cave? Exactly. It's called that. It's exactly. a man cave, you know? And that's exactly. It was created for that intention alone. Exactly. And it's no disrespect to a woman right. or anyone else in the household. Right. Right. They just need their space. Just like we need our space Absolutely. from time to time. And see that's that's again is one of the things I have a problem with when you have girlfriends and then relationships. You know, uh, let's say he's watching that game on Sunday. Mm-hmm. This is the this is the part I have a problem with, okay? He's watching that game on Sunday. You want to go shopping. He doesn't want you to go. He wants you to stay with him. Right. Now, you know, listen to me. <laughs> I don't want to be here, you know? But, right. But sometimes men just don't want you to go away. No, they don't. And, and, and you know something else? They don't want you to leave, but they don't want you to stay and talk. Right. They just want your presence. Right. They just want to be close to you. That's it. They don't want, it's not sex, it's intimacy. Right. Closeness. That's it, exactly. And a lot of the men express that desire to let women know they want to be intimate. They want to be touched. They want to be held. Things in this book that um, during the course of the interviews, mm -hmm. men opened up in a way, now it's in a book where men love it and women need to read some of this information and it will empower their relationships. Right, exactly. You know, uh, the more we know about our partners, the better the relationship can be. Exactly. And, and as we said before, accepting them, you're not going to get changed. For who they are. <laughs> right. You get changed for a dollar. Right. But, but you're not going to change Not them. from a man. <laughs> so what else have you got going on here? I know we're going to have, we're actually going to bring a man up. I'm surprised we have Great. one who's uh, brave enough to come yes, up and have this conversation. But a lot of courage. A lot of courage. So if there's anything else that we want to talk to him about before he, you know, before we bring him up here, anything you want to talk in the book about. Actually, I'm looking forward to... I'm thinking that's going to be a little yeah. interesting. Okay, so... I agree. Let's just take a little break here and we'll bring TC, TC. up here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're being joined by TC Caldwell, real man. <laughs> yeah, okay? Yes. Okay, so yes. you are a brave soul to come up here and have this chat. More than you know. Yeah. <laughs> and we appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. So, would he have been one of the, the guys you would have grabbed off the street to talk to? Actually, I did, but he wasn't on the street per se. He was in a department store. Okay. And as I was shopping, I noticed TC conversing with two other people. I approached him, I had the book in my hand, I told him a little bit about the topic. He developed an interest. At first, he was a little skittish. Well, to have some strange woman come walking up to Strange him. woman, and yeah, the first question definitely. is... Come on in here. No, I, I can't take um, care of you while you... No, I know, I know. I'm just trying to get a feel. Uh, yeah, I, I actually met her inside a department store. I was talking to um, a friend who actually turned into my girlfriend during the during the process of me working with Lolita on this book. Um, we actually started reading the chapters together, and it actually helped us develop uh, what we wanted out of our relationship. And... Um, I think one of the chapters that kind of hit home for both of us, especially me, was um, when loving her is killing him. Because mm -hmm. I've lived that life before. Mm -hmm. I've lived that life where you're you're trying to adore this woman and tell her exactly how you feel, or you know, show her the emotion that she's looking for, and she's just not she's just not accepting it. She's kind of pushing you away and not giving you what you want. So let me ask you a question. Yes. When that happens, does the real man? Keep it, jumping in there, keep trying. You keep trying, you keep fighting, but if it's not being taken, a man can only be beat down but so many times. Right. And that kind of emotionally shuts you down. So when the next person that you meet wants to talk to you, you're kind of you're kind of standoffish because right. you're not sure if you're ready to put yourself out there. Right. So you were saying that you read the book. I read the book. I love right. the book. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's exactly what you would get from any man probably 18 to early 60s, it okay. uh, doesn't matter who you are. Your average Joe or your CEO, it just works for you. No matter what the chapter title is, no matter what kind of relationship you have, whether it's been a month or whether it's been three years, no relationship is perfect, but this will definitely help you. That's great. Now, you told me earlier that this book reminded you of the vagina um, monologues. If I could be so bold, I think <laughs> this would be the male version of the vagina monologues. Okay. Because it deals with every type of man. It deals with the ones who stand offish. It deals with the man who's very proud of himself. It deals with the man who basically just wants to work it out. Each chapter deals with a specific type of man. And I think if men read it and they love it, 
and they can get their significant other, wife, girlfriend, even if they just give it to a random person on the street, a woman or a man, I think it can help anybody. Let me ask you a question because I see this a lot and it kind of bothers me. This is, we're talking about a relationship. Right. Well, there's also the office relationship, you know, where you have a man who might be your boss mm -hmm. or it might be that a, there's a woman who's the boss and, and a okay. younger man. And so you, you see conflict a lot of times because a younger man might not want to be bossed by an older oh, woman mm -hmm. who might kind of remind him of his mama. That That is true. You know? But even So if that, th th this would be a good book for them. This would be a good book for them because this book would if you use certain chapter titles to build that kind of relationship, like as for the example that you said, a younger man versus an older woman being the boss, be yourself, don't pretend. Don't pretend. Right. And he means what he says, what did you hear? Those two chapter titles together can build that kind of foundation for Absolutely. what it is that you need to work on. Absolutely. So what else did you do in the course besides walking the streets? What else did you do? <laughs> well, I was actually um, in hotel lobbies talking to men, since we're talking about the street lady. Right, the street. Yeah. Uh, you get in trouble I, in those I, hotel lobbies, girl. <laughs> I, I, you can. You can. <laughs> you can. <laughs> I uh, met people, met men in laundromats, supermarkets, at work. I invited men from movie theaters. I just approached them and told them what I was working on. And I asked them if they would come on a, a designated Saturday and meet me in a conference room. And let's just wrap. Let's just talk about relationships. And I opened each discussion with one, the same question, which was, what do you want, if you could tell women what you want them to hear, what would it be? And the men opened up and started talking. And I didn't judge them. They weren't judged. Right. I didn't want to shut them down. Right. And these men emoted for over three and a half hours. Okay. Now let me ask you a question. Did we ever come up on the subject of sex? Because there's a lot of miscommunication between yes, couples. Yes, we did. And there's a difference between a man who is 21, sowing his oats, feeling himself, and feeling women out, and getting to know a young woman, and a man who's older, who doesn't think so much about the sexual act, but craves intimacy. Mm -hmm. They crave just being touched on the shoulder, right. and they said that. They, they want to be cuddled, and men said that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of information in this book that truly men have said that you really wouldn't really expect them to say. So we've kind of got the book, the Steve Harvey kind of book, because it's from a man's point of view. I used to do a radio show and it was from a woman's point of view, you know, by women, mm -hmm. from women, from a woman's point of view, because I got tired of, of men telling women what they should think. Exactly. You know, and so this is kind of that Steve Harvey book that takes it all from the men's perspective. Exactly. And we can learn so much about you guys. <laughs> and you I was and you're gonna be in more trouble than you were before. <laughs> That's because this book will help you figure that out. And once you figure that out, everything will be fine. Okay. So. I was just the messenger. There you go. And it's in, the message is in the book. Somebody phone. had to do it. Exactly. And I've got the book here, but we've got the book cover. So if you can show the book cover, we want everybody to go out and buy this book. Check out Culture and Maine website because the information, your contact information will be there. <laughs> Which uh, is www.itsnotpersonal.net, all one word, no apostrophe S. Okay. So go out and get it. Your life's going to change. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, TC, for being the real man and coming up here. No problem. Yeah. I don't mind being the front runner. Okay, there you thank go. Thank you. And thank you, Lolita. It's thank always you. a pleasure. Always thank you, a thank pleasure. You, thank you. Always. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that ends our little segment with Lolita tonight, so get out there and get that book and start reading. It's not personal. You know what it is. That's right. You know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so we are about to take the greatest little trip downtown, and I'm going to introduce you to Christina Clark. She is wonderful. I've been down there before, and the last time I was there, she promised me that she would teach me how to make soap. Even though I don't know how to cook, she's going to teach me how to make soap. So we're going to head down there now, and we're going to come back with some of the sweetest smell and soap you've ever had. Let's go. Let's go. Hey everyone, I told you I was heading down to the corner of Culture in Maine and I was going to catch up with Christina Clark from the Sunrise Soap Company and here we are. Look at this. Isn't this awesome? Hey girl, how are you? Good. Nice it's to awesome. see you. It is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you and I know a lot of people may not think that soap 
is an art, but to me, the way you do it, it's an art film. It's an art. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. These are some of my favorites, and I don't know how you do this, but if anybody's interested in a s'mores, <laughs> a little chocolate, these are real marshmallows. Yes. And, and I didn't know that till I went to pick it up, and it was sticky. I was like, this is a real yes. marshmallow. And real graham crackers. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. When I first did those um, and took them out of the pot of the soap, they were so shiny and bright, and I was like, oh, they look like the toaster pastries that you eat. Exactly. Or with the almonds, definitely looked edible, you know, and then I took a bite. Just kidding. Okay, good. <laughs> this is what's actually under that soap. It's a okay. loofah, okay. so it's uh, So you can use soft. this after the soap is cooked. Yeah. You've got a loofah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Awesome. That's awesome. That is lime margarita complete Ooh. with salt. Ooh. That's a good one. Margarita. Yeah. So this one just looks like a scone. Mm, you know? I don't need scones. Oh, it looks like I love it looks scones. like a loofah to me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what you make this with? Yeah, so this is um the the this loofah part of the loofah put? that's actually okay. kind of spiny. So okay. that one when the soap goes down. It's actually going to get a little scratchy because these are really spiny and uh, scratchy. That's a little cupcake. Mm -hmm. Got sprinkles, real sprinkles. Yep. Glitter. That's what I love about this, a little glitter. This is a celebration in a handful. It is. Yes. And you can light that candle we have. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. You're going to tell me a little bit about what we've got out here. Okay. Okay. Um, we could put anything we want in soap. Uh, we've done coffee grounds before. Uh, we've done hops and grains for the beer soap. We could do peppermint leaves and spearmint leaves. Um, but just a couple of uh, varieties here that we threw together real quick. Just got this one right here. This is actually purple Brazilian clay. I thought this would make a really, really nice soap. This is actually our first batch. Uh, we're gonna see how it goes, but this is really gonna be nice. It is, this is just staring me in the face. <laughs> so what and she's it, looking at is um, jewelweed. It is the natural cure to poison ivy. Really? So in the poison ivy soap, now it's not giving you poison ivy, it's curing it. Right. So when we make that soap and put the jewelweed in it, um, it uh, about a cup and a half will go into it. Okay, these are juniper juniper berries. We did a soap uh, about two weeks ago for the first time ever. Took the juniper berry, uh, crushed it. Uh, we put almonds in some soap. Um, once again, crushed those, polarized those. And then these are the poppy seeds. Uh, the poppy seeds we usually do in the lavender, peppermint, and rosemary soap. This is African black soap. You're gonna teach me how to make soap. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna go get dressed yeah. to make soap. Yeah. I can't even cook, I'm so excited. <laughs> Either can I, okay. I'm really excited. Oh, okay, here we go. Okay, sounds good. There you go, let's do it. Okay. Okay, we're gonna make soap. Yes, we are. Okay. Okay, so what we have here. Don't try this at home. You gotta have goggles and gloves. Right. Yeah. And a lot of love. Yeah. Okay. Well, and a lot of good ingredients. Yeah, okay. And, okay, so what we're starting off with, I don't know if you guys can see it out there at home. It's my seven basic ingredients, really high quality. Um, shea butter, cocoa butter, castor, olive, soy. If I was a commercial company, this would be animal fat and petroleum and chemicals. Okay. So we're not a commercial company. Okay, I'm just kind of stirring this around. What we've decided to do is make lavender soap. Right. So you are gonna pour the lavender that you crushed up. Yeah, I'm gonna say it, I crushed it up. So I just pour it all in there? Yep. We're not big on measuring around here. Okay, I was just making sure nothing would fall out. Yep. So okay. if you want to take the stick blender then and then just kind of... You're trusting me yeah. with an electrical... Uh, yeah. Oh, it's stuck on the bottom. Now when I took this out, Lee said, this looks serious, and it is. If I was hand stirring a batch of soap, it would take me four hours. Really? If I was putting it in a mixer, <laughs> We're not making soap. That is still my oils. Okay. So we, we have a runny liquid oil with lavender in it. Okay. Okay. So now keep this handy. Okay. She is going to add that in a minute okay. when I say. Okay. That is the essential oil that is coming from the lavender. 
plant that's been oh, distilled from the lavender. Like so that. this will be a 100% natural soap and it's got lavender in it. Okay. So there's only one way to make soap and you need to cause a chemical reaction. Uh -oh. So I'm going to take a couple steps back. Okay, I'm going to get what I need. Okay. No, you're coming out front and we're going to hope the place does not blow to smithereens. Okay. Okay? That would be so good. this is what's causing a chemical reaction. It's sodium hydroxide and distilled water. Let's see what happens. See if we're still around. Okay, I'm backing up. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so what's happening right now is a chemical reaction, saponification. The molecules are meeting and soap is being formed. Buzz it. Okay. And then we have to put the... Uh, I'll do this. So. I don't know if you guys can see this or not. Can you guys see this? Oh, okay. nice. So the molecules have met, soap is being formed. A relationship. Yeah, you're doing really well. Thank you. Don't let anybody see this. They might come to my house for dinner. So it's gotten thicker if you haven't noticed. Oh yeah. That's gonna be good. Okay. So we're gonna stop with that. We added the scent. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, okay, we're gonna put this aside. Do you think you can lift this up? Are you strong enough? I don't know. Now you're gonna slowly and gently Pour this in and watch our seam here. You kind of want to pour it right here. Okay. There we go. Oh, there you yeah. Do you do oh this every day? Gosh, can she do this? Yes, she can. What's your seam? Okay. Yeah, but you're. Do I need to do it faster? No, no, no. Just your pot was. Whoa, this is fast. Okay. Oh, it smells incredible. Yeah. You show that there. Can you, can you handle that? Mm -hmm. So then I'll do the dirty work as there you usual. Go. There you go. Okay. So we don't do that for now. Kind of got to wiggle this. Heavy machinery, right there here. There you go. Oh, you want me to dance? Yeah. I'm just swirling. So you're gonna swirl it. But what's gonna happen is you're probably not gonna hold a swirl. No, it's not. Okay. Which means we kind of need to wait. Okay. So maybe in the meantime, tuck the wax paper. Um, yeah. So we put wax paper in for two reasons. Number one, to uh, make sure the mold does not leak because what happens, the bottom falls out of all these molds when we're ready to take the soap out. Let's see that. And then this is 60 pounds of soap. I'm sorry, 15 pounds of soap cuts into 60 bars. It's going to get harder and harder as the um, time ticks here. Okay. Would you call this a clean pot or a dirty pot? It's a clean pot in my house. Yeah, it is. Usually people say it's a dirty pot because there's something in it, but it's soap, so it's really a clean pot. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I yeah. make fudge, so that's like my swirl. Oh, okay, yeah. This is a lot like fudge. Yeah, that's true. And then I think we're done with soap, and we're ready to, yeah, to make that lotion quick. I think we should do it. Okay, so we've made soap. There you okay. go. <laughs> so. We're making lotion. Yeah, we are. I love lotion. <laughs> I think we did an awesome job on soap, though. So if we did that good a job, imagine what we're going to do with yeah, lotion. Yeah, and this happens even quicker. Okay. Um, and I've got the handy dandy yes, electrical appliance. So what we're looking at, my soap had seven basic ingredients in it. Uh, the lotion actually has about six. You will never see six ingredients in a lotion again. It's more like sixty. Okay. Uh, from a commercial company. Everything you can not pronounce, everything in mind you can pronounce. Okay. So we've got our distilled water. We've got we, water. Wa we use distilled in both of these because you don't want the ex extra right. minerals in right. there. And then right here we add the lotion recipe, which is kind of a secret. I want you to start buzzing even there. This thing goes right to the bottom. Gorgeous. I mean, it's already getting thick. Right, and the beauty of it, like I told you, we have about six ingredients in that lotion. And uh, no long list of ingredients here, that's for sure. I'm gonna have to get some of that to take home, because that is gorgeous. Should we bottle it? Gorgeous. hot then? It's not ready yet, right? You're right! You have to right. add <laughs> that natural preservative. She can't just cook that. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I can't cook, but I can make soap and lotion. Yes, you can. There you go. So I just want to say thank you so much. No, thank you. For coming down and letting me come down here and play today. Because I've had a ball. I hope you all have had a ball too. Because 
Come down, Sunrise Soap Company, down on Beaver Street. Come in and see Chris. Tell her you want some of that great soap that Lee made because I got news <laughs> for you. If I can do it, you can do it. I mean, if even Lee can do it, everybody can do it. Okay? So thank you, darling. I need thank a hug. You. I've had so much fun. Aww. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. Huh? See you later. See you. Then. Bye. So we'll see you all. Good night. Thank you.